So we're going to get going. Um, our first speakers, um, Chris uh, Sims. Chris Sims is a certified Scrum Master uh, a trainer and an Agile coach, coach, and also recovering C++ de developer, Chris, right? Um, Chris founded um, uh, Agile, Agile uh, Learning Labs. He's also a product owner uh, uh, at Agile, Agile Learning Labs. I discovered Chris um, a few years ago when I read uh, Chris's book, The Element of Scrum. Yeah. <laughs> so that was actually at the beginning of my, my Agile, Agile journey. And uh, that was, a, that was a, a great book because it's actually extremely accessible for people that, have, that don't have a lot of knowledge in, in Agile, which was my case four years ago. Um, and uh, so, and so Chris was very gracious in in, uh, in accepting to speak. So Chris, I'm, without further ado, your talk is about user stories. Uh, your user stories are too big, so I'm I'm going to leave it to you, Chris. Yay! Well, greetings, everybody in Galway. How you doing? I I don't believe I've been to Galway. I've been to Ireland several times, uh, Dublin, of course, uh, but also Shannon. Uh, which was which was delightful. Um, so now I have to come to Galway so I can like see what see what that's all about. And then when I come there, I can get in on the food. How how is the food? Like we're gonna do fist of five. Five is awesome. Fist is like that was food. Oh look at that! All right, okay, I have extra motivation for me to come now. I love it. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this idea of user stories that are too big because I run into this all the time in my coaching. And um, I see a lot of teams that struggle trying to bring stories into a sprint that are just too darn big. And when a story is too big, uh, there's a lot of unknown and surprise hidden in it, which means it's really hard to make a plan, right? So sprint planning takes a long time because we're trying to figure things out. And then even when we do make a plan uh, and we start the work, Oh, right, those unexpected things show up. Lots of times things take longer than we thought. And so our track record for delivering the stuff we committed to probably isn't so good. And this is one of the things that I've seen make the biggest impacts on how well Scrum teams are doing in terms of making reasonable commitments, getting stuff done. And then at the bigger organizational level, right, when teams get good at this, uh, our visibility goes way up because we because we really have a good sense of like oh what can we expect each you know each sprint from our teams. So, without further ado, let me share some stuff. I will call out that um, this little talk I'm giving you is a shortened version of one that I do that has interactive exercises like at each each of the four techniques that we're learning and. Uh, for time reasons, I'm snipping out the interactive exercises. However, you can find the worksheets and all the details about how to do these and the interactive stuff uh, at smallerstories.com. So if you go there, like all the information I'm going to talk about uh, and related resources are available. All right, so all of the techniques I'm going to share are based on an assumption that you've written an overview statement for your story that looks like this. And I'll be the first to say that, you know, not all stories have to have an overview statement that's written like this, but any story that is a legitimate, like this is something that should go in your backlog story, could be expressed this way. Because all this little, you know, popular format uh, does is it forces you to identify who are we creating this for? What is the deliverable that we're going to create? And why are we doing it, right? Essentially, you know, why is this valuable? And occasionally you might find that, well, we're having trouble splitting this story because we're actually missing one of those things. We don't know who we're building this for. We don't know why it's valuable. Say, like, okay, we'll slow down, fill in that bit, right? You really need the who, the what, and the why. So given that you've got that, however you like to express your stories, you could write an overview statement that looks like this. So based on that, we're gonna explore four techniques that will allow you to break any big story down into smaller stories. Uh, I've, been, I've been using these four techniques for 
oh goodness, 15-ish years, probably some of them a little bit longer than that. And I have yet to find a real world story that we couldn't break smaller using one of these four techniques. I will say there are more than these four techniques out in the world. And I encourage you, the more you learn, the better you are, right? The more tools that are in your toolbox, the better off you are. But if you learn these four techniques, um, I think you're going to be well-equipped. I don't think you'll ever encounter a story you can't make smaller. So we're going to go from kind of simplest and most straightforward on to some of the more subtle techniques. So the first one, really basic, but honestly, I, I use this one a lot in real life, conjunctions and connector words. So when you look at that three-line summary of the story, Anywhere that you find words like and, or, but, with, without, uh, commas often function as the word and, anytime you find one of those connectors, you can pretty much always break that big story into two smaller stories right at that point. So let's see this one in action. So all of our examples in this talk are going to revolve around a tropical destination resort. I don't know what the weather's like there, but it's kind of cold and flirting with sometimes freezing and sometimes not where I, where I am. I'm on the east coast of the United States in a little state called Delaware. Um, let's see, uh, temperature in Ireland right now on the cold side, give me hands if you're like, yeah, it's kind of chilly and cold. Okay, all right, okay. So then, I'm thinking a tropical destination resort might be a good thing to think about. So let's imagine that our product is a tropical destination resort and the things in the backlog are things that we're thinking about adding to such a resort. So here's our first story. As a couple planning a family resort trip, we want separate activities for couples and teenagers so that we can all enjoy our vacation. Who's gone on vacation with teenagers, anybody? A few of us. So a few of you understand this, right? So uh, in the middle of that story, there's a conjunction, right? There's this word and, couples and teenagers. And so we can break this into two smaller stories right there. As a teenager on vacation, I want activities to do with other teens so that I can meet other teens and not be stuck with my boring parents the whole time. Oh, they're so horrible. They're ruining my life. They took me to this tropical vacation. It's terrible. Oh, sorry. Was that my outside voice? Uh, and then we have a story that says, as a couple, we want romantic activities so that we can rekindle our love connection. Sounds like that should be a TV show, shouldn't it? The love connection. Welcome to the love connection. So, oh, where did I go? There it is. So pretty straightforward, right? Just, just literally finding the conjunction, breaking the story at that point, and then thinking about, okay, for this group of people, what do they want? For that group of people, what do they want? And then, you know, thinking about, well, could we implement these things separately? Could we implement some romantic activities and then come back later and implement some teen, you know, focused activities? And yeah, seems like we can. So this is where it would be the first exercise. Did I mention smallerstories.com? You can get all that uh, extra goodness. So the next technique is a technique called, well, actually, let me slow down. Let me slow down. Even though this technique is relatively straightforward, I want to pause and, and give a chance for questions. So if you got a question or a comment, raise your hand. We'll get someone to unmute so I can hear it. Going once, going twice. Okay. All right, second technique. Uh, generic words or generic terms. Uh, so with this one, we're actually still looking at the words that we chose to represent the user story, and we're finding ways to break it smaller. So a generic word or a generic term is something that kind of represents a whole group of things, a whole class of things. And so we can make progress by breaking that into individual examples that are more specific and writing stories for those. Again, let's see this one in action. As a couple, we want romantic activities so that we can rekindle our love connection. 
I, it, it's it's got like a 70s vibe to me right now. I'm hearing like a 70s like TV show theme song in my head. Anyway, anyway. So uh, when we look at the story, there's this word activities. That seems pretty broad, right? Pretty general, pretty generic. And so whenever we see a word that feels pretty general, pretty generic, we want to ask this key question, which is, what kinds of those could there be? So in this case, we'd say, well, what kinds of activities could there be? And then, you know, we make a big list of activities. In this case, we might come up with things like romantic dinners and couples massage, dancing, sunset cruises, a connection workshop, on and on. Many, many possibilities. And then we write stories for each of those cases. So as a couple, we want to get a couple's massage so that we can relax together and reconnect. As a couple, we want a romantic dinner so that we can enjoy quality time together and set the stage for an exciting evening. I think that means watching Netflix. You all have Netflix in Ireland? Yeah, Netflix? Yeah, oh, okay, good. And I understand that's a very romantic activity, is watching Netflix. Um, and then sunset cruise, right? As a couple, we want to go on a couples-only cruise uh, so that we can enjoy romantic moments with no children around. Now, something I want to pause and kind of call out here is that you're probably already noticing that as the stories get smaller, the level of detail goes up. Right, smaller stories actually have more detail in them. We're getting to know more about, you know, what kind of people and the, the nature of the value and all of that. And sometimes as we're breaking the story down, we, we kind of already know those details, we're just capturing them. But many times the act of breaking the story down is something that's gonna lead us to new discovery and a new level of depth and understanding about the original kind of big deliverable. And so this is why it's actually a really great thing to do with stakeholders. Uh, I'm a big fan of teams holding uh, a weekly one-hour backlog refinement session where a product owner might send out a list of stories in advance and say, these are the ones I'd really like to focus on refining this week, bring in stakeholders that are relevant to those particular stories, so that as we're breaking them down into smaller stories, we have stakeholders there in the room who can give us those details about like, what is it about a couple's massage that seems so intriguing, right? What is it about a romantic dinner that would make it uh, special for us? All right, pausing here, questions about anything I've shared so far. All right, so now we're gonna get into the details, right? So eventually we gotta dig into the details uh, of the story to figure out how to split it smaller. So this next technique uh, uses the acceptance criteria for the story to help us find ways to break it smaller. So acceptance criteria are the testable, demonstrable details that are gonna help us know, like within the sprint, when we're done. And so these are important that we identify them in advance, again, in a backlog refinement session, so that when the team starts working on this story, they know what the finish line looks like, right? What are the details that we're gonna demonstrate to show that we really have completed this story as everybody intended and envisioned? So let's see this one in action. So continuing on to just, you know, each one of these examples breaks one of the stories uh, from earlier smaller. So. As lovers, we want a romantic dinner so that we can enjoy quality time together and set the stage for an exciting evening. All right, I, I, big picture, I think I, I, I've got this, right? And in the context of our tropical destination resort, the way I think about this is uh, we probably already have a restaurant at the resort, but we would like to start offering romantic dinner packages. Right? So this is the story that we've put in our backlog to uh, lead us to create romantic dinner uh, package offerings at our resort. So, okay, big picture. This, is, this gives us a sense of who is this deliverable for? What would it be and why is it valuable? But now we need to get into the details, like what does a romantic dinner package offering look like? 
So now we need acceptance criteria. So maybe we say, well, candles and fresh flowers on the table. That seems like that would be nice. Um, you know, we want a lot of uh, options on our menu, right, to accommodate the various uh, preferences and tastes of our guests. Uh, we want a good wine list as well. You know, if you're uh, trying to, you know, keep that romantic spark alive, sometimes a little bit of wine is very, very helpful. Um, uh, live music might be nice, but maybe, you know, maybe not anything too loud, right? Um, and then uh, I think it would be nice if the wait staff was, you know, dressed formally, right? So it's kind of a, feels like it's a special dinner because the wait, wait staff is all in, in formal attire. So that might be a reasonable set of acceptance criteria for our original story about a romantic dinner package offering. So let's see how we're gonna take these acceptance criteria and be able to use them to break the original story smaller. So you remember that uh, three line overview statement. In the middle, it has this line that starts out, I want blank. Well, an acceptance criteria is certainly something we want, right? We want candles and fresh flowers. We want a variety of options on the menu. So the first step in seeing if we could, you know, break an acceptance criteria out of the original story and turn it into its own story is to plop it in here. Then the next thing we do is we ask ourselves, well, when that's true, is there some value created, right? Is there some value that arises, for example, when, you know, we have a, a good wine list? And if we can come up with, you know, some value that that creates, great, right? We've got that third line. And then finally, we ask ourselves, well, is there a stakeholder? And I define stakeholder as anyone outside of my team that is invested in what my team is doing. So is there a stakeholder, someone outside of my team uh, who cares about this value, right? And if there is, huh, we have the makings of, of a user story. And then finally, we have to ask ourselves, well, could we implement this small piece separate from the big piece, right? Now, there might be a dependency. It might be like, oh, we have to do one before we do the other, but could it be implemented separately? And if the answer is, well, yeah, right? We could implement uh, the original bit in one sprint, and then we can implement this other bit in the next sprint. Ah, it's very likely that we found that we can pull that acceptance criteria out, make it its own story. So let's see this one in action. So here is our story and the acceptance criteria that we came up with. So we're gonna grab that first one and put it right in the middle, right? We want candles and fresh flowers on the table. And we ask ourselves, well, is there some value that creates? We say, well, yeah, it, you know, it makes the mood more romantical. And then we'd ask ourselves, well, who's gonna get that value? Well, you know, it turns out this romantic couple. And then finally, we would ask ourselves, well, could we implement a romantic dinner package offering at our, at our restaurant, but we don't have, you know, fresh flowers and candles yet, but then in the next sprint, right, we make a deal with a local florist, we go buy some candles, and boom, now our romantic dinner packages have even more value because they now have candles on the table and fresh flowers. I would say, yeah, we, we probably could start offering a romantic dinner package even before we had candles and fresh flowers and then add the incremental value uh, of candles and fresh flowers later. So that would lead me to believe that, oh, this is a successful split of the original story. We found a piece that was living as an acceptance criteria that actually could be broken out and be its own story. Now, another way you'll know that it's successful and that it really is could be its own story is that, of course, you have to be able to come up with acceptance criteria for the new smaller story. And then perhaps at some point in the future, if you need to break that story down, oh, and you can do it again. Uh, so I like this approach. It's kind of recursive, right? It's almost like turtles all the way down. Uh, questions about that technique or thoughts or comments or abuse? 
always in for, you know, some good abuse. No. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, I just had a question in terms of like when we're breaking down these stories in terms of at what point are we showing there's value in these stories being generated? Because you know yourself, people will always ask for things. I like to like say that the leadership that we work with sometimes are often like my five-year-old, you know, that acceptance criteria is everything that they want, but not mm -hmm. necessarily everything that they need or should have. So how do we tie that bit into breaking down our stories that, yes, we could break this work down, but is it actually going to generate the perceived value or benefit that you believe it's going to bring the organization or the customer that we're supporting with this? Oh, there's a couple of layers to this question. I really like this one. Um, so the first bit I'd like to talk about is, yeah, that problem of stakeholders, they, they want all the stuff. Right. And not necessarily all the stuff is super valuable. Right. And I find that actually getting good with story splitting is really helpful here because inside of a big story, there might be, oh, 20 percent of that original story that really holds perhaps 80 percent of the value. Right. And then the rest of that story is like, no oh, stuff that's nice to have. And yes, it would be good and all of that. But if if our goal is to kind of produce value at the fastest possible rate, right? Always be working on things that are really high ROI. Story splitting actually lets us a way to, gives us a way to chop the original big story down to like some of its essentials and focus on implementing those parts that are going to deliver most of the value and then perhaps defer, right? The other parts that are like, oh, that would be nice to have, certainly, but it's probably not the core. Right. In terms of bang for the buck, oh, it's not as good as, as the other parts that we've already delivered. So I find that getting good with story splitting helps us there. The other thing I hear in your story that I want to address, and let, <clears throat> let me change my little virtual background so I can point to some stuff, is probably about now, most of you are starting to get this idea that like, wait, we, we could just continuously split stories, like without end. So, so these techniques can be dangerous, right? The team might be like, hey, has anyone seen our product owner? Like, I, I don't know, she went into her office to, to split a story yesterday and no one's seen her since, right? So I think that the really interesting question is, well, when should we split stories, right? And I find there's like two compelling reasons. So the first one I call uh, product backlog hygiene. And so it works like this. The life cycle, so you know, here's kind of like the, the basic scrum cycle. Here's our product backlog. And then I've got you know maybe a weekly backlog refinement meeting over here on the side. So the basic cycle that I find is we get a request. Somebody has a cool idea. We, maybe we talk about it in sprint review because maybe that's where it came up. We bring it into a backlog refinement session. We talk about it, maybe not too long, because it's like, yeah, this isn't going to be super high priority right away. And so, you know, we get a high level sense of it. We get some high level acceptance criteria, uh, maybe identify some areas we want to do a little research. We give it a great big estimate and boom, you know, it's down here in our backlog. And maybe the estimates, you know, really big, 233, you know, story points or something. And that's okay, because the other things down there at that level of the backlog are similarly sized, right? 144, 233, 377, whatever. By the way, what does it say that Chris has like Fibonacci numbers memorized up to 377? Not good things about my social life. Anyway, so we've got these big things down here, right? And that's fine, because we're not going to get to them for a while. But over time, right, this idea starts to rise in priority. And it gets to a point in our product backlog where it's like, oh, the other things around it are more like 21 and 34, and this thing's still huge. Oh, for, for backlog hygiene, right? Good, good backlog housekeeping. It's time to bring that thing in and break it into some smaller stories and get the next level of details about those stories and all that. And then, you know, they go back in there. And I find that this cycle repeats itself several times until, you know, any big idea turns into like a whole bunch of really small sprint ready stories up at the top. Um, so that's one reason to split a story. 
just like, oh, it's time, right? Where it is in the backlog, it's too big for where it's risen. The other reason, and this kind of ties back to your question a little bit too, is that maybe we have this big idea and maybe, you know, an executive or something is really excited about this. Oh, we got to do this, right? I heard that the other companies are doing AI blockchains. We need to do that too. I don't even know what an AI blockchain would be. Anyway, uh, so one of the things we can do is we can take that big story, find some small piece of it to split out, move that small piece to the top, implement it early. Number one, we can generate some early value to our users and customers uh, without having to implement the whole great big thing. But then number two, it gives us a way to test our belief that this thing really is valuable. So an example might be uh, coming back to the tropical destination resort. Maybe we think that uh, the people who come to our resort are going to want to like do business center stuff. Oh, we should have a business center at the resort. We're like, okay, that's kind of a big story. Right, We have to have a room and wiring and computers and networks and printers and chairs and furniture and all that. It's kind of expensive. But one of the pieces, maybe one of the acceptance criteria on the business center story is that people can do printing and copying and maybe even faxing. Do people fax anymore? Who's faxed in the last five years? One. Oh, okay. So... Um, so yeah, we have this belief that people want to do printing, copying, and maybe faxing. Well, we could break that part out of the original story and implement it early as like, you know, we buy one of those multifunction devices, we put it up at the front desk, and we put flyers in the rooms that say, hey, if you need to do any printing, copying, or faxing while you're here at the resort, come to the front desk, we'll do it for free. And our belief is, right, that people want to do business center stuff while they're at our resort. Well, what if we implement that, you know, relatively inexpensive printing, copying, faxing solution, and in the next six months, nobody ever uses it, right? It's just gathering dust. Maybe we shouldn't invest in a business center, right? Because we, we ran an experiment to test our belief that people wanted that, and the data that came back didn't verify our belief. So that's that's a... I think an excellent reason to split a story is to like find some sliver you can pull out to test your belief that you should even do the the rest of the big story. So were, were those thoughts helpful? Were those at least in the right neighborhood of, of your question? Okay, good. So we've got one more technique to go. Timeline analysis. And I've uh, heard other people call this use case analysis. It is very much related to techniques such as story mapping or user journey mapping. Essentially what we do is we take the story and then we imagine what will the user do with this functionality we're gonna create uh, and what's the timeline of their usage gonna be. So this isn't an implementation timeline. This is from the point of view of the user. Oh, when they go to use this capability, what does that look like? First they do this, then they do this, then they do this. So we're going to dive into the menu uh, for the romantic dinner uh, offering. As a diner in the restaurant, I want to be able to choose from steak, fish, and at least one vegetarian option so that I can satisfy my dietary and flavor preferences. So we're going to ask ourselves, oh, well, when this diner interacts with the menu, what does that timeline look like? So... Uh, you know, I might start out by like looking at the pictures, reading some descriptions. Uh, I might uh, be interested in calories, so I might I might look into that. Uh, might check the prices of the the things that I'm really interested in. Uh, I kind of want to learn about some daily specials, right? It's kind of fun when there's some stuff that's not on the menu, and the waiter comes and tells me in elaborate detail the, about the daily specials. And then I definitely want some time to consider my choice. And then eventually I want to place my order and then give the menu back to the waiter. So that's the timeline of my experience as uh, someone in the restaurant interacting with the menu. So just like we did with acceptance criteria, we start out by grabbing a timeline step, dropping it in the middle of an overview statement, asking ourselves, does that create value when that happens? 
And then if it does, who does it create value for? And I found with this technique nine times out of 10, maybe even 19 times out of 20, it's creating value for the person who's taking the action, but not always. Sometimes our users do things um, that actually are creating value for somebody other than our users. That happens. So it's good to know who's getting the value. So let's try it out. Uh, I want a menu that at least lists each item with a description and picture, right? Because our first acceptance or our first timeline step was I'm going to look at the pictures and read the descriptions. All right, we ask ourselves, well, does that create value? And yeah, it really helps me decide what I'm most interested in. And then we ask ourselves, well, who does that create value for? And in this case, it's it's the diner at the restaurant. And then finally, we ask ourselves, huh, could we implement, uh, you know, pictures and descriptions even before we have the rest of the menu, maybe even before we have the rest of the restaurant? How many people think that we could come up with our descriptions and our pictures even before we had a menu, even before we had a restaurant? Yeah, absolutely we could. And this might be one of those examples where by creating this small thing up front, right, like the items that are going to go on the menu, we can learn a lot about the prospective customers at this restaurant. And that may greatly influence like how we even design the kitchen, right? Because we can test out our beliefs about what sorts of dishes will people want by creating descriptions and showing them pictures, then we can get those in front of people and say, oh, which of these are most appealing? Uh, what would you hope to find on the menu that you didn't find? And so we could iterate on this even before the rest of the menu is figured out, even before we've built, built the restaurant out. All right, so we've looked at <clears throat> four techniques. Um, as I've said, I have, literally never run into a real world user story that we couldn't break smaller using at least one of these. So if you take a little time, practice them and, and get good with them, I think they'll serve you well. Uh, and you can find all of that detail at smallerstories.com. Floors open for questions, comments, or just me saying, thank you for having me. This has been really fun. You were just, I was just bouncing off what you were saying. Actually, I'm saying here. You say, you, you were just saying that you found that uh, at least one of those techniques work. Do you find that one, is there one in particular that you find works more often than the other? Or, um, you know, when you go through them all or, or, or a combination of a few, you know? Yeah, I, I definitely use all four. I will admit that my go-to, the one that I probably use the most is acceptance criteria. Because I can, you know, if it's a well-formed story, it's going to have acceptance criteria. And I find that a majority of acceptance criteria, so more than 50%, can be broken out and become their own smaller stories. Um, sometimes there are acceptance criteria that really are just acceptance criteria. They're, they're attributes of what we want, but we, we really can't create that attribute on its own. But more than half the time, I find that, you know, an acceptance criteria can be broken out. So that's, that's kind of my go-to. Uh, but I, I really do, I really do use them all. And I find that people who live a little closer to the uh, user experience side of the world uh, tend to go with timeline analysis as their go-to. There's a fair bit of investment of time into sort of refining these stories further and further. I'm curious what the primary gain you've got from this approach is what a few ideas curious to see what you've seen with your experience yeah i would say the the biggest wins are a deeper understanding of what our stakeholders really need because the act of splitting the story into smaller pieces leads us into those next levels of of discussion and exploration and so we have a deeper better shared understanding of what they need which in turn leads to us like building the right thing sooner Right. All too often we like take something big. Uh, there's not a ton of detail around it, but we're like, oh, yeah, we know what that is. And maybe we invest weeks and weeks building it. And then we show it to our stakeholders. and They're like, what's that? We're like, oh, it's that thing that you asked for. 
And they're like, no, that's not what we had in mind. So I think one of the big wins that I see is getting to that shared understanding so that we're really building the right stuff. Uh, and then another big win is kind of the stuff we talked about a little earlier, which is we can actually figure out which pieces of the big thing to not do, which is a which is a big win. Uh, and then the probably the final one that's also really big is that by having less surprise, less unknown in the stories that come into the sprint, um, we have a better success rate in terms of like actually delivering the stuff that we committed to. So, uh, you know, less stuff that's rolling over and better predictability and, and all the goodness that comes with that. Now, I will call out that I think going really small is only appropriate for the very top of the product backlog. In general, I like to see two to three sprints worth of like really small sprint ready stories up at the top. And then below that, I actually think it's good for things to gradually be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you get to these like giant things down at the bottom. So, I, you know, I, I definitely think you can go too far, right? If you start refining these things down here really small, I think you're probably wasting a lot of time um, for two reasons. Number one, there's a bunch of things down here at the bottom part of your product backlog you're never going to get to. Right. So if you invest a lot of time in refining them really small, you're not going to get any return on that investment. The other thing is, even if you do get to them, right, like we refine things really small, but we don't get to them for three or four months or six months or whatever. By the time they get up to the top, the world has changed. And so we may have to revisit all those details because, you know, they, they seemed right six months ago, but they're not, you know, really what we need knowing what we know now. So so those are some thoughts you know, about the, the value and the benefit of doing it. And also some cautionary thoughts about like, you know, don't, don't overuse the technique. Is that helpful? What else while we've got each other? Yeah. And um, just one more, like you're talking about user stories here at a scrum level, like with a team that's going to be producing and putting out. What about actually the use of story levels outside of that team in terms of like connecting it to objectives, key results, you know, the actual executive vision and mission of what it is that their organization is going to do so that you can actually lean out the whole organization's kind of change portfolio or, you know, run operation and that kind of stuff just by connecting people to a common purpose, common way of language, common way of working. Yes, absolutely. And, and I don't know what how much more to say other than yes and absolutely, other than I might add this. Um, when I'm working with organizations at, at like the portfolio level and the strategic level, an anti-pattern that I see is there's a group of leaders who are thinking about big picture stuff and they're coming up with ideas and capturing them however they capture them, maybe even in user stories, who knows, but however they're capturing them. And then they do some planning work, right? They get somebody to come and put some like high level estimates on those big ideas. And then they, you know, line things up and, and then they kind of come to the organization with like, here's the roadmap, Ta -da! right? And I find that unless those things actually exist in teams backlogs, it's really just a wish list. It's just a like, here's some things that would be really great if we could do. And so what I try to do with them is I say, Take your big ideas, um, and I love, you know, I come from the Scrum world, so I love expressing them as user stories just because it's like, who's getting value from this, right? What What is it we're delivering? Why, why does it matter? That forces us to at least capture that. But then take those and do just enough splitting to identify teams that are likely to do those split out parts, run to the teams, get high level estimates. The teams don't even need to break them down small or just let them be big and then put them in the team's backlogs. And then that way we can do that higher level planning based on, oh, well, we have teams, we know their velocity, and we can make better decisions about making, setting realistic goals. And the thing that I think is hardest for folks uh, throughout the organization, but especially at the top, making those really hard decisions about what not to do and what to defer. Because there are always like more things that seem really important and really useful and valuable, and we should do this. 
than we're going to have capacity to do. And the higher up the organization we get that visibility, the the easier it is to, you know, make the trade-off decisions and be good about limiting work in progress and, you know, increase our throughput that way, right? Because if we have teams working on fewer initiatives, those initiatives get done sooner. And then we can pick up the next one. Is that is that relevant to your your thought and your comment? Is or did I did I miss it? No, yeah, that's it exactly. It's just kind of you know sometimes when you go to these bits, people kind of sit it from their perspective of where they sit within an organization and how they interact with things, and it's just reminding people that there's the things can scale, things can move, you know, wider than their original intended purpose. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I find there's a lot of value if you can get people at different levels in the organization actually using a similar vocabulary and similar concepts, sometimes just at a different level of abstraction. But it, it helps helps us communicate better. Chris, that was very insightful. Um, personally, I feel I'm going to take from this the, the, um, the possible conversations that you can actually have by using those techniques and getting more understanding of, 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 of uh, what needs to be done. Chris, that was, that, that, that was very insightful. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm, but uh, again, really a, a privilege to be here.